So, last week <clears throat> we did finish off in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we will move right into 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, we'll get there in just a few seconds. I'll give you a few seconds to get there. I mean, you should already basically have your, have your bookmark there, because that's where we've been for the last several months. We will be there for a while still given the fact that uh, we're going to go through the whole book. And so, so put a bookmark there for Sunday mornings. If I'm up here, if I'm not up here, they'll go through Galatians. But anyways, the Apostle Paul has moved on from the issue of the division that had been going on in the church of Corinth. And so he's kind of moved on, and he's moved into, as we covered in chapter 5, into the disgrace of the sexual immorality that, it, that had not been dealt with. And so he's, he's jumped from that issue to, to this other issue. And our text this morning in, in 1 Corinthians 6, which we will cover the first eight verses, deals with the disorder that afflicted the church there in Corinth. It, it, it was still a disgrace what was going on. As he, as he kind of changes the subject just a little bit of what's going on, it was a disgrace, but it continued to divide the church. It was causing division. And so just as, as, as a reminder, because we have people coming and going all the time, the book of 1 Corinthians is a corrective letter. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with difficult issues that, again, had gotten all the way to him. He's 200 miles away to the east across a small ocean, and, and he's dealing with these things from over there, writing to them. He's already written them a letter that's not part of the canon of Scripture, but he's already addressed some issues, and this is now another letter. Even though it's our first Corinthians, it's another letter that he's written to them. But he's writing to them that in the hopes of when he does show up, he doesn't have to deal with these issues anymore. That they've taken care of them. And so he's writing these things so that they may resolve them. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's read our text this morning. Dare any of you have a matter against another? Go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are, are you unworthy to judge the, the smallest matters? Do you not know that, you sh that we, will, or we shall judge angels? How much more things pertaining to this life? If then you have judgment concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who is able to judge between his brethren, but, brother, but brothers go to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? Now therefore... It is already an utter failure that you, for you that you go to law against another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat. And you do these things to your brethren. It's a sad commentary. It's a sad commentary to know that the, the church at Corinth, it seemed like, was rapidly losing their, their, their testimony of, of the things that God had been doing in that church. Again, that church has been going on for over four years since Paul started it. And, and, and Paul was with them for a year and a half, teaching them doctrine, showing them the ways of the Lord, the things that, that they should be knowing, from the rudimentary into the deeper things, I'm assuming. 
for him to be there for that long and, and, and for, for these things to be occurring and them not dealing with it, it's a sad commentary. To say that those outside the church saw the things that were going on. They knew it. It's sad because they had a view of the church because of them, because of the way they were conducting themselves. Now, now for the most part, I think the church or the people outside the church, and say what you will about the world and, and the things that they do, they are the world. That's what they're supposed to be doing. But say what you will about them. The way they view the church and the Christians, I think for the most part, they, outside the world, they expect the church and Christians to be different than what they are used to. In other words, they expect righteousness and even perfection to those who profess to be Christians. Even though the Christian might say, well, hey, I, I, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's one of our outs. It's like, well, I, I'm not, but they expect something different. And I don't blame them. Because again, they should be looking at you and saying, oh, you profess to follow Christ, even though I don't believe, even though I'm not a churchgoer, even though I might be an atheist. If you're claiming that, then walk it. Then do it. I think what they at least want to see is some genuineness and some sincerity in, in how we conduct ourselves and what we do with the issues at hand. It, it ought to be different than what the world does. And whether they realize it or not that they're expecting more from us, I think it's valid for them to expect more from us. Because when their lives fall apart, and maybe you've been there. When, when, when you're lost and your life starts falling apart, guess who they're probably going to come to at work? If you've claimed to be a Christian and, and you're, you're, you're conducting yourself in a different way at work, and they might be making fun of you, <laughs> but when push comes to shove and they have nowhere else to turn, I know they can get drunk and turn to their drunk buddy, but for the most part... They're going to go, hey, can I talk to you, man? They expect something different from you. Because even though they're not walking with the Lord, they know what a Christian should, should be like and act like. And so when their, their lives are, are falling apart, they want to turn to somewhere where they think you have it all together. And you have the answers to deal with life. And again... I mean, we, we, we don't have it all together. Every, like I've shared with you time and time again, everybody that walks through these doors has issues, all of us. And we battle life. But we also have the Word of God of how to deal with issues. Not, not to fake it, but to at least be different in how we, we conduct ourselves. And so I don't blame the world to, to look at us and say there should be something, something different. What was unfortunate about the Corinthian church was that not only did the unsaved know about the immorality that was going on in the church and in the assembly, but they were also aware of all the lawsuits <laughs> that, were, that, were, that were happening involving all these people that were Christian and how they were suing one another. They weren't suing a, a, a non-believing business, and maybe they were but they were suing one another. They were turning on each other and going, I'll see you in court, Brostein. I'll see you in court. It's like, that should never come out of your mouth to a brother, right? But they saw that. They heard about that. They were probably involved in all of that. And so they were not only able to see and hear about the sin of the flesh, this immorality, but they also saw the sin of the Spirit, which, which I would say are the spiritual issues that could be dealt with within the church. They were seeing those things. In, in, in the things that, 
that regard forgiveness or reconciliation. That was not happening because they're taking them to court instead. Those things are the spiritual issues in that realm that should be dealt with within the church. 2 Corinthians, I'm going to give you tons of scripture, so you might want to be writing stuff down today. So, so 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all, filthy, all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And, and, and I think that the lack of the fear of God in the Corinthian church that, that permeated within the church brought them to this place that, that they're just going after each other. I, I, again, we're, go, we're going to see that they ought to have known, but they just didn't have the fear of God, it seemed like, to do these things. And so in verse 1, he says, Dare any of you, So you, you can see if you have your bulletin or look up there, you, you, you can see how I, I took this phrase and used it as, as the title for this morning's message. There are any of you. And, and the reason being is because as I'm looking for a title, and that's the hardest part of putting a message together. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but coming up with some, as I'm looking at this, it just popped out at me. Dare any of you. And I liked it because you could almost hear the disdain, the contempt, and even the scorn that could better, better be translated, how dare you do something like this? Now, I, I, I'm posing it as a statement because of the disdain or, or, or contempt and scorn that I sense as I'm reading the text. But Paul is asking it as a question. Because he wants to know why. Why are you taking this avenue? Why are you taking this, this route or route? Why are, why are you going in that direction? In, instead of knowing what God says, why are you doing this to one another? Now, now I hope you kind of understand my thought process, my, my brain of why I'm posing it as a statement instead of a question. Because, again, as I'm looking at that, I think Paul could have gone either way with that. He could have posed it as a question or, or a statement. How dare you? How dare you do this? Because it looks like the actual inference is why would you or why are you why are you airing out all this dirty laundry? When we or, or when you are very capable of dealing with it in-house. Again, not, not, not that this, this laundry couldn't be dealt with, but why are you taking it outside the church when, when it's supposed to be taken care of in the church? Now, some would say, well, well, maybe they weren't taking care of it in the church. And that's a possibility, I guess. But they could have. Now, Again, in, in reading commentaries and stuff like that, but in understanding that region and that history, or the history of that region, the Greeks in general, and the Athenians in particular, which wasn't that far from Corinth, they were known for their involvement in, in courts, going to law, going to the law. It, it is said of a Greek playwright... Aristophanes, who, who, who was one of the beginning, beginners back in the 4 B.C. hundreds, somewhere around there, to, to introduce satire and, and comedy, vulgar comedy at times, in, in, into theater. But this is what, what it, it says, that, that one of his characters 
looked at a map. He has one of the characters look at a map and ask where Greece is located. When it is pointed out to him, he replies, Oh, you must be mistaken because I don't see anybody in lawsuits there. <laughs> I can't see the lawsuits. Because that's what they were famous for. And again, he, 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 he would spin it and kind of joke about it. But that's who they were. And so it seems that, that in this time frame where, where, where the church is now going, there, there was a lot of frivolous lawsuits going on, not only outside the church, but inside the church. There were some frivolous lawsuits going on in that region and in that time. And it kind of almost sounds familiar, right? When you think about it, and so, again, because everybody goes to court about everything, everybody's suing every. I think we can understand a little bit more of, oh, I get it. I get what's going on. Now, as familiar as it might sound in dealing with the things of the world, once again, it's sad to think <laughs> that this was going on in the church, though. Again, if that's going on in the world, let them do what they do. That's, what, that's who they are. But it's sad to think that it was happening within the assembly there in Corinth. And so again, it was another appearance or manu- uh, manifestation of this divisiveness, this disunity that was happening within the church. The Amplified puts verse 1 like this. Does anyone of you dare, when he has a matter of complaint against another brother, to go to law before unrighteous men, men neither upright nor are right with God, laying it before them instead of before the saints, the people of God? So he's, again, he's, he's going, dare any of you, having a matter against another. Now, I understand, <clears throat> I understand that there are criminal issues that have to be dealt with civic court. I understand that. Because of severity of crimes, even within the church, that, that, that might have to end up in, in, in a, a, a court, a court of law. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. These are issues that pertain to this life that are probably able to be dealt with, but they're taking it outside the church. The, these were matters that needed to be settled like brothers and not adversaries. Because they were brothers these brothers were related in the common faith. Again, once, once you come into Christ, once you are in Christ, you become part of a different family as well. You have your biological family, but now you have the family of God that you are a part of. And you're a brother and sister to one another. And when this starts happening, you're, you're, you're disrespecting your brother or your sister. So, so these matters should be taken care of as brothers, not as adversaries. You, you see, it would have been better if they would have just had a family meeting than making it into a public spectacle. The fact that, that, that you would have a, a matter against a brother and then you go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Again, the Amplified just told us got done telling us how how these unrighteous men were neither upright nor right with God. And even though a judge outside the church can be impartial and neutral and somewhat unbiased because he has nothing to do with the church, he's detached from the church, that wasn't the prescription. That wasn't the prescription from the Lord and the Word of God for the church. Not for them, but for for the church. Jesus said this in Matthew 19, 28. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that in the regeneration, 
that the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now I understand that Jesus is talking to and about the twelve apostles, but the principle of judging matters within His family within the church, is being set up here. Again, he's going to allude to that in, 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 in the rest of our, or in the next couple of verses about judging. He says you're, you're, you're going to unrighteous men instead of going before the saints. And, and as we've covered before, that word saint is one who is set apart from the world and set apart for God. Hence, making a saint sanctified, holy, set apart. It is, or it should be, (laughs) but it is the heart of a saint to know the heart of God. And not only to know the heart of God, but to have the mind of Christ. So that the love of God and the wisdom of God can rule and reign in our hearts and in our minds to be able to settle such issues and matters that come up in and between the family of God. And so in verse 2 and 3, he says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? The phrase, do you not know? It shows up in the old King James here, or the the, the new King James here. It, It shows up 17 times in the New Testament. Ten of those times, it shows up in the book of 1 Corinthians. What's fascinating is, six of those ten times shows up in this chapter alone. This morning, we, we, we look at two of them in our text, verses 2 and 3, where, where, where he says, do you not know? And, and Paul is pointing to some truths, some certain truths, that they should have known. And if they, if they would have adhered and done what those, those principles told them, these truths, they wouldn't be in this situation. They would have dealt with it already. They wouldn't have allowed it to linger and, and go outside the church. And so the implication is that they, they should have known these things. Which I think is ironic and because I'm sure it painfully hit them right in the heart because the church of Corinth and that whole region, they were enamored with their own wisdom and knowledge. And so he's going, don't you know? Which again is kind of a dig going, you should know. If, if, if you hold knowledge and wisdom up here and yet you don't know these things, I taught you these things when I was with you. And so the two, the first two of the six do you not know phrases have to do with the role of the saints judging. (coughs) Judging the world, and for that matter, judging the supernatural things, that is the fallen angels. I I have some scriptures for you. Again, taking the inference of, of what these scriptures are saying, when Jesus is speaking in John chapter 2, verse 22, He says, for the Father judges no one. He has committed all judgment to the Son. In Revelation 3.21, he says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcome and sat down with my Father on his throne. And so again, the inference is God 
has, the, the Father has given the Son all authority on, in heaven and earth to judge. And, and we get that scripture at the end of Matthew right before he tells his disciples, now go therefore. Go do the work that I've called you to go do. And so in, in, in talking about, okay, so, so are we going to be a part of judging the world later on, however it happens? But Peter says this in 2 Peter 2, 4. It says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. In Jude, verse 6, he says, And the angels who did not keep their, their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserve, reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And so Paul is, is telling the Christians here in, in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, I think I taught you guys these things. I'm sure I taught you the doctrine of this when I was with you for a year and a half. Because again, it's almost like this in, indisputable, indisputable proposition that he has given, that he's saying here. Do you not know that you're going to judge the world? Do you not know that you're going to judge angels? You should know. And it seems kind of funny, or should I say interesting, that here the Corinthians, they boasted about their great spiritual gifts, as we will see later on. And yet when it came to judging or settling these issues, they couldn't. And I just think that's kind of funny. Really, you, you, you have... You're, you're, you're that spiritual, and you can't solve these problems? And I will say this, acting spiritual and being holy are two different things. There's a lot of people that act spiritual, but their lives are not holy. How much more then? How much more then? The th things pertaining to this life at the end of verse 3. You see, they should have been able to deal with these matters that pertain to this life. Because for the most part, the matters that pertain to this life, there are temporal issues. And they should have, would have, and could have been dealt with. There are issues that pertain to this life. That if we have the heart of God and the mind of Christ, He has given us His wisdom and understanding to take care of these issues that pertain to this life. In, in verse 4, He says, If then you have judgment concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? The, the, the thought of dealing with these matters that pertain to this life in, in the scope of a larger judgment that is to come later on that the church will be a part of because they are in Christ and be a part of that whole thing however it, it works out. I, I, know, I know I've shared this with you that oftentimes when I'm reading, a, especially here in, in, in 1 Corinthians, I, I sense Paul's sarcasm. Again, you, you might be going, oh, Pastor Zeke, he's not sarcastic. It's like, really? You don't read that? I read it. And maybe because I'm sarcastic, <laughs> I read it that way. I'm bent that way. But you can almost see that, that this topic, what he's sharing with them, almost brings out that sarcasm once again. Now, now this, this phrase where, where he talks, do you appoint those who are least esteemed in the church to judge? That, that phrase can, can be interpreted two different ways. So, some interpret it to say you are better off asking the weakest member 
of your church to settle the matter than to go before the most qualified judge out there. Now, that's not a put down in any way, shape, or form to, to, to the weakest member of the church. That's not a put down. Because on the most basic level of Christianity, just knowing a little bit what's right and wrong because the scriptures give us that common sense, to have the, the heart of God and the mind of Christ and know somewhat of the scriptures, you have more wisdom than to deal with these temporal issues than anybody in the world. The other way to look at it, to be interpreted in the most common, is why do you appoint someone who has no standing in the church? That is a non-believer. Why, why would you appoint a non-believer to judge matters that could and should be decided from within the church? And again, that's not a put-down to the judges who do a fine and dis decent job interpreting the law of the land. They are set for that. It's interesting because, the, the, I don't know if it's a Hebrew or the Greek word or maybe both, the word judge is God. <laughs> they are put in that position to make distinctions and judgments like God would in that respect. But these matters were none of their business. And I would say that they would say as much. Why, why are you bringing this to me? In, in Acts chapter 18, verses 12 to 16, it says, When Galileo was pro council of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it is a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourself, for I do not want to be a judge in such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Isn't it embarrassing? Isn't it a shame that, that the Christian would take this to, to, to a court of law, an issue that should be dealt with, and that the court is saying, why are you, do you guys, you guys can't deal with it? Why are you bringing this over here? It, it's funny that, that, that maybe even a, a Christian judge, or, or he would go, guys, this is not the way you do it. Or even the non-Christians would say, I don't know much about the Bible, but I do know that you should be taking care of this matter. That would be embarrassing. And so Paul says in verse 5, I say this to your shame. Again, I truly believe that Paul meant his sarcasm to embarrass them. In other words, he, he, he wanted to move them to shame. To make them feel little and petty for what they had allowed. And I know some people are like, well, that's not very nice. Of course it's not. But they shouldn't have been at this place anyways. But here's a guy in authority saying, this is to your shame. And, 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 and when you read that next part... He says, is it so that there is not one wise man among you? Not even one? Again, I have to say, man, it sounds like Paul's just not letting up. And, and as I interpret it, it sounds like he's saying, okay, you mean to tell me that there is not one wise man among you. Not even one. How about you just give me a wise guy? <laughs> At least a wise guy. But you mean to tell me that there's no one that can deal with this?
They should have been embarrassed. I know I would be embarrassed. I would be so embarrassed if someone said that about our church. There's not one wise man there. Again, I know we're a bunch of wise guys here. A lot of us are. But I also know a lot of you, not just from the pastoral staff, but I know a lot of you. And God has given you wisdom. And, and I don't think that you need to have letters before or after your name to give some good and sound biblical counsel. I, I, I would say that, that you should be in a place that anybody should come to you for some counsel, not just the pastors. If you have the heart of God, if you have the mind of Christ, that you would also have the wisdom of God in your life because you're of the way you read your scriptures. Not because of your Sunday morning attendance or your Thursday night, because you read the scriptures on your own. Because God has given you wisdom. Because God has given you the understanding. To have not one in the midst of a congregation of any local church is a sad commentary. Now, I get it. There's some churches that don't want to deal with hard issues. And I can't tell you how many people I've gotten to counsel from other churches, and I'm going, why are you coming here? I'm not educated. I don't have no degrees. I don't have nothing. And I tell them as, as much, I'm not a professional in any way, shape, or form, but I will give you the Word of God. I'll punch you in the face with it. <laughs> if that's what you need, if that's what you need, I will... I will, I, 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 again, I, I will encourage, but I'm not afraid to rebuke. But there's some churches that don't want to deal with that. And to, to that, I say, close your doors. Close your doors if there's not one wise person, one wise man among you that is able to deal with the hurting people that have some issues that are going through it. Do you not have something in the Word of God that you can give them? Some good and sound biblical counsel? 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says, all Scripture, all Scripture is given for inspiration, by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, <clears throat> for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You don't have to give them your opinion. You give them what God says. Nobody wants to know your opinion. They want to know what God says, and they're coming to you oftentimes because of what God says. Where am I at? <laughs> There's not one among you who is able to judge between brethren. I'm in the middle of verse 5. It's like, where is I at? Who is able to judge between his brethren. Again, having the Word of God, knowing the Word of God, and applying to Word of God, you are qualified. You are qualified to judge between brothers. Again, you might not call yourself a, a, a counselor or whatever, but give them the word of God. That's all you've got. That's all that God requires of us to share those things. But brother, verse 6, goes to law against brother and that before the unbeliever. It's almost, it almost sounds that Paul's sarcasm has turned into disgust, being repulsed even, being at nauseum. And what Paul meant for embarrassing them, 
It's almost like Paul in this verse is embarrassed himself. A brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. The Amplified puts verse 6 like this, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before Gentile judges who are unbelievers without faith or trust in the gospel of Christ. That's who you're going to? Verse 7, as we close up. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm like early. Yeah. No, we still got a long ways. <laughs> <laughs> got you guys all excited, huh? <laughs> it says, now therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No. You yourselves do wrong and cheat. And you do these things to your brethren. Dang. The, the, the first part of the verse can be read like this. It's already a, a complete defeat on your part. It's already a complete defeat on your part that you would go to this place. It's an utter failure. In other words, at this point, it doesn't matter who wins or who loses. It's a lost, lost situation. That you have gotten yourself to this point, nobody's going to win here. Even though you might win the case, shame on you. Shame on you. It's an utter failure that you've taken it that far. Because they're all going to experience a far greater loss in their disobedience to the word of God. Because instead of having a family meeting and taking care of it within, they've, they've made it into a, and it's become a public spectacle instead. Because now it's out there. Which things should have been dealt with in here. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated I'm sure Paul is referring to Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount as he's telling his disciples, telling his people. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 39 to 40. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever will slap you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone, anyone wants to sue you, and take away your tunic, give him your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. I think what Paul is, is saying, and what we learn here, it's better to lose your money and your possessions. Let him take it. And lose a brother. And then lose your testimony as well. But I think this is where our pride, even within Christians, this is where our pride drives us to, ha to, to get the upper hand. And, and, it, and it is our pride that, that, that jumps in to make sure that we're never being taken advantage of. the aggressor or, or provoker, <laughs> the one who is fighting for her rights, fighting for their rights, needs to stop. Why do you have to be on top? Why do you have to win this one? Why? On the other hand, if you could, if you could at least <laughs> exercise some humility... Accept the wrong, Paul tells him. Accept it. Let yourself be cheated. And again, that's hard, right? Because nobody wants to be cheated. Nobody wants to be wrong. And I think oftentimes it's like, well, no. Because if I let that happen this time, it's going to happen again. And 
And I know what people are going, but pastor, you don't know. It's like, you don't think that's happened to us? To me, personally? Or to us as a church? It happens all the time. Many times, more times than, than I would like for it to happen. But there's times that, say, that God says, wear it. Just wear it. Dang, Lord. See, in, in my flesh and in my pride, it's like, I'll put them in check. And I can put them in check. But there's times that God says, no, just eat it. Be wrong. Be cheated. And that's hard. <laughs> because when they do it the second time, you're going, what's that old fool me once, fool me twice, whatever that thing is. It doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to Christians. It's not a proverb <laughs> that we can turn to. <laughs> but what if you are the one that's being attacked? And that perpetrator, that aggressor, that, that provoker is not just somebody from church. You go home to that. For Paul to say, accept the wrong, let yourself be cheated. I know oftentimes our retort would be, well, of course, I'll put up with it. Yes, because that's what the Word of God tells me to do. But pastor, how long do I do it? And how many times should I allow it before I put a stop to it? Dang. In Matthew 18, 21 and 22, it says, And Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive them? Up to seven times? I'm sure, I'm sure he was expecting it. like, yes, Peter, seven times. My goodness, that is a lot of times. I'm sure that's what he was expecting from Jesus. But Jesus says, I do not say up to seven times but 70 times 7. I wrote it down 490 times. <laughs> Say what? 490 times? And I, I, can I just say, I find it interesting that Jesus was talking about in a 24-hour period. <laughs> How often do I forgive my brother on a daily basis? In one day. Up to seven times? Seven times for the same thing. That would be enough, right? I would put my Christianity aside probably and go, nah. <laughs> I'm going for it, right? But Jesus is saying, no, always do it. Again, when? Because again, we see Jesus like, well, Jesus stood up against some peeps. Okay, then weigh those things out in your life. When, when, when will he tell you, hey, just take it, wear it? Again? Again. Wear it. It looks good on you. What do you mean it looks good on me? <laughs> that I'm being wrong, that I'm being cheated? It's like, yeah. It looks good on you as a Christian. Because the pride part looks ugly on you. It looks horrible on you. It doesn't fit you well. Humility, that fits you well. And again, I know that some people is like, I don't know about that. When do we do that? Again, when you look at the life of Jesus, there was times that he stood up and he called somebody a hypocrite. He called them a snake. He called them a, a, a whitewashed tomb, which apparently was really bad. <laughs> and he got in their face and he didn't let them get away with it. But there was other times he didn't even say a word. Why? Because he was about to die for the sins of the world, and he was quiet through all of it. He could have snuffed all of them out, but he didn't do it. And even when they're crucifying him, and, and he looks down, and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And you're going, you're kidding me. And I know what most Christians would say, well, I'm not Jesus. But we have the, the example of Stephen who, who is going through something. And they're coming against him. And as they're stoning him, and he's just a regular guy like you and I, and he looks at it and says, 
Lord, don't let this charge put, be put against them. I probably paraphrased that one. Don't let this be, be put against them. And if Stephen can do it, and God tells you, wear it once again. Again, if you're, if you're the one that needs the last word, if you're the one that's a perpetrator, knock it off. Really, go, go back to the scriptures. Ask God, do you want me always to put people in check? Do you want me to be the one that's hurting them? Pray that. See what happens. <laughs> I can almost guarantee you <laughs> he's going to go, you're kidding me. How dare you even ask me? <laughs> Be cheated, be wronged. It's hard, it's not easy. But he didn't tell us, oh, and it will be easy for you too. That's not one of the verses. It doesn't say, and you will like it. It doesn't say that. He says, no, you yourselves do wrong and cheat. And you do these things to your brethren. When we're being cheated and wronged and then we end up coming back at them, you've put yourself in that same position as they are. And you end up being wrong and you cheat. Especially if the Lord had told you, shut up. Don't say a word. Wear it. You're going, I've worn it three different times, Lord. I'm not going to do it this time. And you become disobedient. So again, as we're praying, Lord, when, when do I take a stand? When do I don't? When, when, when do I, I, I don't do it? And again, that, that's a difficult thing. Again, having to study this and having to share it, it's like, man, Lord, I know how hard it is in my life. But to be able to be wronged and to be able to be cheated by someone and then look at them as if they've done nothing to you and greet them as a brother. That's what God would require of us. Because when humility is tried, it, it, it works every time for the glory of God. But whenever pride rears up its ugly head, you don't win, nobody wins. The enemy wins. <laughs> But that's what we have to weigh out, right? And you do these things to your brethren. How dare you? <laughs> Let's pray. Jesus, we look to you and we thank you, Lord. <clears throat> your word is so good to us, Lord. Once again, Lord God, it teaches us. It tells us, Lord, what we ought to be doing and what we ought to not be doing, Lord. Lord, I pray, God, for my brothers and sisters who are here this morning. Father, again, Lord, I don't know, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know if they're the perpetrator or they're the, the prey, it seems like, or the victim that's always being cheated and, and wronged. But, Lord, I pray that you would give them your heart, that they would put on the mind of Christ, Lord, to deal with the issues, especially if they're the ones that are wronging people and hurting people. That you would bring conviction upon them, Lord God. That you would break them, Lord. Father, for those who continue to wear it, Lord, because you've told them to, I pray for strength. I pray for wisdom. I pray, God, that you continue to minister to them, Lord. I pray for wisdom on our part here at church, as staff, as leaders that, Lord, we might be able, Lord God, to give good and sound counsel, biblical counsel, Lord, whenever people are going through it. And we want to humble ourselves before you, Lord. Lord, it, they're not easy issues that people go through, but I pray for them. I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would minister to them, that they would get on their knees, Lord, and truly seek your face for, for resolve. And so we thank you, Lord, Father, I pray for anyone who might be here today, Lord, who may not know you, who, 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 who is so far away from you, Lord God, and you've drawn them in, and you've called them, Lord. I pray that their hearts would be turned to you, Lord. I pray that, Lord, they would cry out to you. 
Father, and that you would meet them right where they're at, Lord. That you would save them and bring them to a place of salvation, Lord. Understanding that you love them so much, Lord. And so we look to you and we thank you, God. Go before us, Lord, in the things that you've taught us today through your word. Lord, if there was anything from my lips that wasn't from you, let it fall to the ground, Lord. But help your word. Help, help the word, Lord God, to penetrate our hearts as we go out. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Let's stand.